I think the current thinking is it's not necessarily the level of one or two particular toxins that may be problematic, mm. but you start being aware of four or five that you're actually exposed to. And those four or five, even though if their levels are not problematic in themselves, the combination is going to really create a problem. Yeah. And I think this is where the awareness is taking us. I think what's important to understand is that uh, there's only one mycotoxin that's actually regulated. That was the first, first mycotoxin that was discovered in 1960, which is aflatoxin. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Uh, my name is Sam Rochel. I'm an associate professor of poultry nutrition at Auburn University and one of the co-hosts of the show. And uh, today I'm joined by an esteemed, a longtime professor in poultry nutrition and also a, a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Mike Lilburn, uh, who's going to talk a, a bit about uh, some of what he's uh, been doing since his, his recent, relatively recent retirement uh, after a long career in poultry nutrition. So, uh, Dr. Lilburn, great to see you and uh, really excited about the conversation today. Well, it's good to be here, Sam. Um, I think, as you mentioned, um, I retired five years ago from Ohio State. I was on the faculty at the Agricultural Research Center in Worcester, Ohio, for 32 years. Um, I spent five years uh, in the industry before that working for a primary breeder, Hubbard Farms. And um, for any young scientists out there just graduating, uh, those first five years in the industry before going back to academia were absolutely the best thing that could have happened to me. Uh, there weren't positions that were open. And so going into the industry, I, I got a good feel for it. Uh, the broiler breeder segment obviously is very specific, but most importantly, I made a lot of contacts and a lot of friends. And so when I went back into academia in 1988, um, I had a feel for the industry. I had a lot of contacts and, um, and those contacts and really my knowledge of the industry is really what guided a lot of my research over the, uh, the ensuing 32 years. Um, and then the other thing was I had a wonderful mentor in grad school at Penn State. And so one of the things that took me back into the academic world was also having students and being able to work with graduate students, which um, certainly was, a, was one of the highlights of my academic career. You've worked, um, you know, on a lot of different topics um, throughout your career. Um, and, and since retiring, you've done some consulting and things and been uh, spending a lot of time focusing on on mycotoxins. So you just give us kind of a brief, you know, history around uh, the mycotoxins and, and regulatory controls. Yeah, um, I was approached by a company a um, little, well, about two years ago. Mm hmm. Um, about doing some work with them, um, doing some technical writing. Uh, what really attracted me to this particular company was that uh, they have the only patented uh, blood biomarker um, technology mm. um, available to the, the poultry and swine industries uh, through a series of very extensive validations. Um, basically, they've shown where uh, taking a, a blood sample um, applying it to a, a card, an FTA card, drying it, and then using um, high resonance uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, they can come up to, they can, they can get up to 36 um, toxins, but more importantly, they can get up to 36 included in those 36 toxins are metabolites. Mm. Um, not all the toxins that are consumed uh, appear that way in the blood. Mm -hmm. uh, a good example is uh, deoxynevalanol, Don, probably one of the most common toxins we're concerned with. Uh, and poultry appears in the blood as Don sulfate. Um, and not all species are the same. In swine, uh, Don appears as Don glucuronide. Okay. And so basically they validated what was the, the primary metabolite um, to be able to use. And then also the species differences in those metabolites. Um, and so they have been trying to then market this technology along with a, a mitigation product, a feed mitigation product. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been very well received by the industry. Um, it's new and part of what I've done over the last 18 years, um, along with their, uh, their mycotoxin guru in Spain, mm -hmm. is to give presentations to companies and, um, and share the technology with them. 
Um, I want to give a little uh, advertisement for this summer at the Poultry Science Meetings. Sure. We are going to have a mycotoxin symposium, and um, we are going to have some of the lead scientists from other com- other companies that are involved in this in the mycotoxin technology world, as well as two very good scientists from uh, USDA in Athens. It is really the only institution in the U.S. where there's active mycotoxin research going on. So uh, I'll be the moderator of this symposium. And so anybody that's listening to this podcast, I just want you to be aware of that. Very good. No, I'll certainly be in attendance there and and look forward to learning. You know, I've heard a lot about and and concerns around mycotoxins the last year or two. So certainly this is a timely area. And I know it's something that's on the, the industry's mind. You mentioned uh, Don, what about, you know, when we're talking about poultry, what are some of the other common ones that, that you've seen in, in the last couple of years in doing this work and which seem to be the most problematic? And are there any new emerging ones? Well, I think the big thing, um, Sam, is that, you know, we've got four or five mycotoxins that are on the tip of everybody's tongue. Um, mm-hmm. I always talk about awareness. Um, mm-hmm. We do a pretty good job through the industry of mycotoxin awareness you know, both during and after a a, a given harvest year, Uh, through Neogen, through um, Alltech, uh, through DSM, we can get a pretty good handle on different regions of the country and, you know, which particular mycotoxins are problematic um, in those regions. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that our traditional uh, mycotoxin testing revolves around aflatoxin, Don, uh, fumanacin, uh, T2 toxins. Those are usually the big four. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can usually use a, a rapid test at a feed mill to kind of get a, uh, a very simple but a cursory view of um, the four of those mycotoxins. You can send a feed sample away to a, a good lab, and there's a number of those, again, regionally. And the list expands to about 16 different mycotoxins. Mm-hmm. And when you start taking the blood samples, um, Again, um, you can add not only the toxins themselves, but also their metabolites and, and get a picture of 36 potential toxins the animal could be exposed to. Mm-hmm. And so I think that is the, you know, the question here is um, we're often looking at, say, the levels of one or two toxins. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you look at Don, for instance, and if you get above one part per million, you start getting concerned. Mm-hmm. I think that as you start expanding the profile of the number of toxins you're looking at, I think the current thinking is it's not necessarily the level of one or two particular toxins that may be problematic, Mm -hmm. but you start being aware of four or five that you're actually exposed to. And those four or five, even though if their levels are not problematic in themselves, the combination is going to really create a problem. And I think this is where the awareness is taking us. I think what's important to understand is that uh, there's only one mycotoxin that's actually regulated. That was the first mycotoxin that was discovered in 1960, which is aflatoxin. And Mm. so really, if you think about 1960, um, it's a relatively new field, mycotoxicology. Um, Mm -hmm. Aflatoxin is very oncogenic uh, at very low levels. Mm -hmm. And so it is the only mycotoxin that is actually regulated, very tightly regulated at 20 ppbs, part per billion, Um, There are recommendations for the others. I mentioned one PPM for Don and some of the others. But those are just recommended levels. They aren't necessarily regulated levels. And I think that's an important thing for people to understand. Mm -hmm. Aflatoxin itself now is really not really considered a problem. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is people are so aware of it at such a low level that you very, re- you very rarely see problems with that. Yeah. So that's kind of where we are on the, uh, the normal, what I would say, platform for mycotoxin testing. Yeah. Ready for more sustainable poultry production? New data suggests that decreasing bacterial loads in feed using Termin 8 supports entric health, leading to improved performance. Gut health is more than a gut instinct. Learn more today at www.anatox.com. Makes sense. And so you mentioned that, you know, we're starting to learn more about we had these individual kind of levels that we, we look at in the feed and finished feed. Uh, but also, you know, the combination, the total mycotoxin load. What about other factors uh, independent but can also interact? So like maybe heat stress or coccidiosis, other gut health challenges. Do you, is, is there anything you've been able to identify that 
to really watch out for in that regard? Well, I, I think that, you know, obviously gut health is the big buzzword, has been for the last five or 10 years, yep. and will continue to be a buzzword moving forward, you know, particularly as we're in the, uh, the antibiotic-free era. Mm-hmm. And so if you think about, for instance, interactions with coxie, um, if you've got a, a subtherapeutic level of four or five different toxins that in themselves may not be problematic, uh, what happens if you have a low level of a coxie challenge, as an example? Mm-hmm. Um, right. Or, you know, depending where you are in the country and your ingredients, you know, we, we know that there are a number of perturbations, dietary perturbations that can aggravate, you know, the intestinal lining that can create some physiologic issues. And so the question is, you know, are combinations of, subther- of, of subtoxic mycotoxins, are they, for mm-hmm. instance, a tipping point? you know, where right, right. they really kind of take us over the edge in the face of the, the normal production challenges that we see. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The other thing that's come out of this that I think is really important and changing the subject a little bit here is what's called the emerging mycotoxins. And, mm-hmm. um, and emerging are not toxins that are new, but what's happened through, you know, increasing technology is that there's actually a class of fungi called alternaria. And most people are familiar, you know, familiar with the aspergillus, familiar with the fusariums. But many people aren't familiar with these alternaria species. Hmm. And these alternaria species can be problematic because, you know, at temperatures that normally kill off the fungi, the typical fungi and typical toxins producers. Now, these alternaria species continue to continue to survive. And hmm. through the testing, and a lot of this has been done in Europe. Um, Europe is still a hotbed for mycotoxin research. Mm-hmm. And in particular, um, one of the toxins that have come up just all over the place is called tenozonic acid. And it is a, a um, actually some of the first tenozonic acid research was done by Joe Jambrone at Auburn in 1978. Oh, wow. And so yeah, I often wow. cite that, I often cite that citation that it's not an emerging mycotoxin. Mm-hmm. It's just right. one that we're not aware of. Yep. But in Europe, they're very much aware of tenozonic acid. And as an example, um, there was a really neat paper. And Sam, my academic background, a lot of times <laughs> when I give talks, I make sure I have citations just so people know that, sure. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not Mike Lilburn talking. You know, I have citations to back things up. That's right. But anyway, but what's happening, for instance, in Europe, they've shown that a lot of tenozonic acid, for instance, is showing up in baby foods. Mm-hmm. You know, showing up in a lot of, you know, human foods. Mm -hmm. If you take wheat, for example, and you break down the different parts of wheat, you find very, very little tenozonic acid, for instance, in flour. Where do you find tenozonic acid? In the byproducts. And the thing I say to people is, you know, you know, how many of us use wheat mids in some one of our poultry diets? Right. right. You know, and yet that's the, uh, the partitioning of some of these mycotoxins within a given cereal grain that can become problematic. And my, my concern that I, I, I say to folks is, you know, if it's on the European radar screen, if there's concern in Europe with it occurring, for instance, say in baby foods, mm-hmm. we need to be aware of it here because that information will come across the ocean. Sure. And it is one of, there's a couple of other um, uh, emerging mycotoxins, but tenozonic acid, I would say in all of the analysis we've done of layer feeds, broiler feeds, and turkey feeds in the Midwest for customers, um, even when there's not a lot of the typical or classic mycotoxins present, we see levels of tenozonic acid. Mm. So it is certainly present. It's just one we're not aware of because our technology is not sensitive enough. I should say routine technology is not sensitive enough to pick it up, but I, it, it is something we need to be aware of. Appreciate the work you've been doing on this. All right, thank you. Okay, bye-bye.